Welcome to the Busiversary, 14th edition. It's 14 years of the video bus, and we're going to talk about we're going to talk about the programs that we produced in Flying Focus Video Collective That's in the right. past year. And uh, this is part two. So uh, if you missed part one, you missed out a lot of stuff about the Middle East. On, on this half, we're going to be covering a very wide range of topics, uh, health care, women's issues, the economy, and so on. And you'll see that we're just ordinary people who picked Do up cameras. Doing extraordinary things. Doing extraordinary things, picked up cameras, and are producing our shows through Portland Community Media, which uh, anybody can take the classes here and make their own shows. So uh, if people want to get involved, we're going to be flashing up our numbers throughout the show. And one of Here's them is one of them, 239-7456. That's area code 503. And the other phone number is 503-321-5051. And we have email at uh, ffvc at flyingfocus.org. So uh, we'll get started right away with the clips on, uh, for this half of the show. Here they come. So I'm back now with Barb Green who's been with Flying Focus for about 10 years. And this year I went out and videotaped Howard Lyman, who talked about health care and animal rights issues. And Barb put the show together. And do you want to tell a little bit about what he was saying? Um, yes. Um, I originally joined Flying Focus uh, because of animal rights issues, and because animals get so little airtime on commercial TV. Um, in this particular program, Howard Lyman, who is a fourth generation cattle rancher, talks about uh, health issues and um, problems with the environment and the uh, atrocities that are committed against animals in the meat and dairy industry. In this particular clip, he's talking about um, the, when the, the best things to get out of your diet um, for health reasons. The first thing I recommend to people to take out of their diet is dairy products. And somebody says, why dairy products first? Because we know that 87% of dairy products protein is a thing called casein. When casein were fed to critters that had cancer, 100% of them died. When they took critters that had cancer that were fed a 5% plant-based diet, 100% of them thrived. The fact of it is, casein supports the growth of cancer. And here we are in the United States of America, one out of every three Americans today has cancer, one out of four are dying of cancer. We have more people working in the cancer industry than we have people that are dying of cancer. It is one of those profit centers of our society today. First thing out of your diet, dairy. Second thing out, chicken. <gasps> what would the colonel say? <laughs> In my opinion, nothing gets more chemicals, hormones, and antibiotics than chickens. They actually grind up live chickens in factory chicken operations and feed them back to other chickens. And then they go out and scrape up the manure and feed it back to the chickens, which gives a whole new meaning to finger licking good. First thing out, dairy. Second thing out, chicken. Third, fish. No woman ever considering having a child should eat fish because of the mercury, dioxin, PCBs that are stored in their body, and when they become pregnant, it's transferred from their body into the brain of the fetus. We are destroying. We're destroying the planet. Never have we had less topsoil than we have today. Never have we had less mature trees than we have today. Never have we had less fish than we have today. The list goes on and on. Hi, I'm back now um, here with Yvonne uh, Simmons, who's been with Flying Focus for quite a while, longer than I have, in fact. And um, Yvonne and I worked on several shows this year uh, having to do with women's issues. Um, this next clip, though, Yvonne didn't work with me on it, but she was actually in it. Um, and if you watch the clip very closely, you can, um, you'll catch Yvonne. I was a Rosika Schwimmer, a very outrageous Hungarian woman. All right, let's take a look.
to celebrate the 90th anniversary of Women's International League for Peace and Freedom. Started in 1915 with the advent of uh, World War I. And we've been going strong ever since, trying to find other ways to solve problems rather than actually go to war. And to alleviate the underlying causes of going to war, oppression, economic injustice, um, sexism, all of those things um, lead to conflict. Um, when did you join Well, I have been a member probably 19 years. Not to be overwhelmed with despair before this talk today, I consulted one of my favorite writers, Arundhati Roy. She also, in clear and compelling language, sounds a call to action. I found it difficult to choose which passages to read from it in her works, but especially enjoyed when she wrote that we must reinvent civil disobedience in a million different ways and become a collective pain in the ass. So we're back now, and uh, this next program Yvonne and I did work together on. Yvonne um, taped it all, and I edited it. So why don't you tell us a little bit about this program? Well, th this year I was invited to the Female in Mediation's um, Practice in Peace in, in, in War, in war mm -hmm. Conflicts, uh, in Barcelona, wow. in Spain. Um, while I was there, the, the first clip that you're going to see is w after that I went to Rome in Italy and I interviewed Giuliana Scrina, the Italian journalist that was held hostage. And in this clip she's telling, saying what it, it did for her, mm -hmm. how it changed her politically and mm -hmm. etc. Um, the second is, the, the other cl clips are of um, Tandi Modise, who is a South African legislator. And the actual clip is about how, who she says she is, um, which is quite interesting. Mm -hmm. And then uh, there is Sanam Andalini, who is an Iranian woman. Uh, and she, um, she's, she's talking about what women can offer to the peace negotiations. Quello che mi è successo in Iraq, il sequestro e poi la sparatoria che ha colpito la macchina su cui viaggiavo quando stavo arrivando all'aeroporto mi ha portato sul piano professionale Iraq, e ho avuto indubbiamente una delusione perché il mio sequestro ha in qualche modo interrotto un lavoro che ho stavo facendo sul terreno e per me era un nedello I was able to confirm the methods used by the Americans. They absolutely do not respect the civilians and they don't take any risks. They are only concerned about their own safety. Therefore, the US soldiers shoot in any manner whatsoever without any warning. They are only concerned about their own safety. When US soldiers feel they are threatened, they shoot that they can meet each other here, uh, connect themselves in Barcelona, and also explain to women in Barcelona what they are doing and all the strategies they have developed to mm. build peace. And we should recognize that, that as women, we, we, we may bring in different skills and different perspectives into peace negotiations. And it's important because, again, peace negotiations and building peace is a really tough process. So we need all the help. I, I do a lot of things, but currently I am the speaker of the Northwest Provincial Legislature. I am a peace worker. 
I am responsible for the South African Women in Dialogue Space Desk, Africa Desk. I am also a counselor in Robben Island, a former political prisoner, a former guerrilla, and I write poetry. So you've been traveling a lot lately, as we saw from those last clips, and in this next program, um, you went to Peru, right? Yeah, this, this is, uh, I've been twice recently, and it's, it's taped from both those, those times. Mm -hmm. And the, the, clip, it's, uh, the clip shows where I was working, which uh, is on the, the largest garbage dump I've ever seen outside Lima, where 20,000 people live rummaging around the garbage. Um, and I work with an NGO called uh, Centro Proceso Social, and they got money to get land which, uh, to do a vegetable garden. Mm -hmm. And it shows you the first day of work of the women, 15 women work, working. And, and then um, when the, the vegetables were growing, which is very um, And this is right very interesting. in the middle of the garbage dump? This is away from the garbage okay. dump. With a, and at the end, there's me doing okie-cokie with the kids, because right. I work with the kids. Mm. This, this is Las Lomas de Carabayo. It's the largest garbage dump outside Lima, Peru, about half a an hour, three quarters of an hour drive. 20,000 people live here, there in these houses that you can see their shacks and they're built on tons and tons of old garbage. This is down the hill from Las Lomas where the NGO Centro Proceso Social has been able to buy a piece of land and build a garden, a hydroponic vegetable garden. And this is the first day of work that the women, 15 women and one man who lost his wife, uh, are working so that they can grow vegetables for themselves and then sell them and not have to go to the garbage dump and search uh, for material to sell to make a living. And here is the professor who oh, taught okay. the women <coughs> how to work the garden. And they know quite a lot now. The women haven't seen the professor for some time. And he's He's come at the moment to tell and, and telling them that the under the leaves there's some fungi that they're going to have to do something about. I think I must have done 500 okikokis when I was there. PC here, back with Adam, and we're going to talk about a uh, program about Peter's story. Mm -hmm. um, this is the one I did the sound on? Exactly. Yeah, Peter's story is a South African Methodist minister who appeared in Portland uh, earlier this year. Um, he was minister to Nelson Mandela when he was a political prisoner, later appointed by Mandela to head the Truth and Recon Reconciliation Commission of South Africa. Mm -hmm. So we're going to see a couple clips. The first one, it shows uh, a, you know, he tells the story of how a victim of apartheid violence mm -hmm. is forgiving a perpetrator. The second clip is about the church, South African church's relationship with the Communist Party there and mm -hmm. the unique relationship. So here are the clips. All South Africans have to admit this is what happened, this is what we did. This is our history, we have to live with it. Secondly, the victims are moving toward healing. Here is an old black lady, she's blind. Her son was tortured and killed by the secret police. The man who did it is sitting on the other side of the room confessing what he did. Because she's blind, they take her arm 
and she is led across the room and like any unsighted person she begins to very gently feel the contours of his face her thumbs rest below his eyes and she feels his tears and then she says something she says the bible says we must forgive and so i forgive you and he faints he collapses he collapses under the pressure and pain of what it costs to be forgiven in the years between 1990 and 1994 particularly i found myself working quite closely with members of the communist party because they were part of the national peace accord and uh, I, I found it to be a very uh, instructional thing to be working with them. Uh, we came from different places, of course, a church leader and a member of the Communist Party. We thought. When Chris Harney was assassinated, I mentioned his assassination. Now, Chris Harney happened to be a leading young firebrand of the Communist Party. And when he died so violently, uh, I got a message, Bishop, would you come to Communist Party headquarters? We, we're having an emergency meeting. We've got a crisis. And I went to those headquarters, the first time I'd been into Communist Party headquarters. And there I sat down with a whole lot of other people who had been invited to come and talk about how we were going to hold this country together from blowing apart. And the person who now found himself in charge with Chris Harney being dead turned round and said, well now, uh, well before we begin, perhaps Bishop, would you say a prayer for us? Adam, you're going to do a program clip on Social, Social Security. Security. Yeah, this, is, this show follows the Oregon United to Protect Social Security campaign, and we're going to see three clips, one of Earl Blumenauer at the 70th birthday for Social Security, one of State Representative Mitch Greenlick, and also a uh, senior recipient, started out upper middle class, ended up on Social Security for survival. So now this privatization scheme is dead in the water now, so the campaign is over. But here are the clips. Nobody knows if they're going to be widowed, if they're going to be disabled. 31% of the beneficiaries of people who have the social insurance component privatizers, people who want to take the program, never talk about. They don't give up. We need to be strengthened by this experience. Continue to send the message that we're going to protect Social Security. We're going to protect Medicare. My concern is not um, a livable retirement wage. In my case, it's a matter of just plain survival. I am 74 years old. I just had my birthday on June 1st. Um, I'm proud of it. I'm a survivor. I live on $690 a month Social Security. That is all I have. In 1935, we came into the modern world because almost all of the industrialized world before that had the notion of Social Security. Not individual security, and we can tell you that you lose $180,000 in, in personal benefits, but in my mind, that's not the point. This isn't about individuals, and it isn't about individual accounts, and learning how to do things. It's about the very fabric of our society, the very notion that became so important in the Depression, and so clear that a patrician like Franklin Delano Roosevelt could go to the map to make sure this happened because of the view that we are all in this life together. And that, and that it's not about what my benefit is. What my benefit is, I, my life, my, my uh, satisfaction of life is diminished whenever there's somebody in my society that can't make it. It's back with Adam. And Amy Goodman is our next clip coming up? Yes. Tell uh, me about that. 
Well, this is where she, she appeared on her exception to the Rulers book tour from last year. Right. Um, uh, the show covers a lot of personal experience from her, especially the role of independent media. The, c the clips we're going to see is um, first she's talking about war criminals, including bin Laden and members of the administration. Uh, the second clip is going to be, um, uh, oh yeah, democracy and independence of East Timor. Uh, so here are the clips. Yes, on September 11, 2001, we were united with people around the world against terror. I don't think the answer was the chant that went up around President Bush when he came to Ground Zero, USA, USA, it sent a chill through me. No, the answer is a global community united against terror. I do think that Osama bin Laden and his accomplices should be tried for what happened on September 11th and if found guilty, severely punished. But I also think that Henry Kissinger should be tried for war crimes. And Donald Rumsfeld. Cheney and George Bush. The longtime rebel leader of Timor, Shanana Gushmao, who had been imprisoned by the Indonesian military for many years, now the founding president, ascended the stage and he raised the flag of the Democratic Republic of East Timor. They had resisted, they had believed always that someday, this day, would come. They have taught us all an incredible lesson. And they also acknowledged repeatedly that it was people around the world that helped them get to that point. People like many of you, over the years, they knew they couldn't have done it without you. And it is a very important lesson to all of us that every day, every hour of every day, we have a decision to make whether to represent the sword or the shield. Democracy now. I'm Dan, and I'm back again to talk about some shows I did that weren't on the video bus this year. They were kind of a speakers and events mini-series based on the National Coalition on Police Accountability Conference that I actually helped organize here in Portland in October of 2004. And it ended up being nine hours worth of footage from a very long conference. I had help from Barb, who you've seen on the show, uh, Tim Young, who helped start right. the group with us yeah. in Flying Focus many years ago, Martin, who you also saw tonight, and Karin Johansson. And uh, there were five separate chunks of the show. We're going to see parts of three of them. Uh, and I wish I could tell you all the, co all the topics you're not going to be seeing because uh, there's a lot, a lot involved. But you're going to be hearing about uh, homelessness and uh, Latinos who are taking matters into their own hand by cop watching and a couple other things in the clips that you are going to see. The National Coalition began in 1991 as a result of the Rodney King beating. Uh, several people here uh, belong to the National Interreligious Task Force on Criminal Justice, which was meeting during the time that meeting took place. And we decided there had to be some sort of a more organized response. And uh, after some planning sessions, had our first conference in Chicago that fall. We must keep the pressure on. We must always let the city officials know and the community know that we will not tolerate anyone violating the trust of any citizen using any scapegoat excuse to murder someone in the name of quote unquote the blue uniform it consists of uh, 10 to 12 youth that are range ages from 13 to 29. And we wear bright red uh, shirts that on the back say Negro Patrol. Uh, 
and we go out into the community, various bus stations, where all the time police officers use tasers to ta um, against youth, especially youth of color, well, only youth of color, and Border Patrol are doing raids at bus, bus stations, bus stops. And then we also go out to supermarkets where it's predominantly the Latino community. The interaction between the homeless and the police community, I call it from where I see it in my perspective, domestic terrorism. To me, where I sit, the objective is subtle genocide. I'm not trying to be politically correct, human rights picture the homeless. I see law enforcement's interaction on a national basis with the homeless population as domestic terrorism. It's the end of the video bus for this year, the bus anniversary, the 14th anniversary of it. And we're going to be doing more things next year, such as? Well, producing a show. We produce the show every week. And right. uh, we're, we involve people in, very, in various different ways. So if you want to get involved, um, you can call our phone numbers that are up on the screen right now. One of them is 503-321-5051. Two three nine seven four five six, and our email is five o. Uh, <laughs> our email is ffvc at flyingfocus dot org, and if you have any questions about anything um, and or f ways to support us, uh, you can just call us, and uh, we'll get back to you as soon as possible. And it's really easy to get involved. And I really also want to thank Moss, who's directing the show. He actually provided the music for the uh, Encopa right. programs that I did. Uh, he wrote that many years ago, and I used it again this year. And we want to thank all of you for joining us tonight and hope that you keep an eye out for the Flying Focus video bus. Let's uh, have you come and work on the video bus next year. Come see us now. <laughs>